Do you struggle with running a campaign or doing a project and what was supposed to be a small thing blows up into a huge monster of a project that is hard to conceive, let alone explain? This is that story of one DM that tried to run a campaign that was extremely ambitious. He crammed multiverses, time travel, and he ran it all for 24 players. The only problem is, he's not a good DM. As the campaign goes on, his sanity breaks down, his players become less interested, and he becomes progressively worse for it. This is the first of a two-part series, but first, sponsor time. Well, well, well. Writing a new D&D campaign, are we? That's a big task. A homebrew world, too? I must ask, when all the details are done, how do you plan on organizing it? Yes, very nice. But what if I told you the secret sauce to doing all that, but almost automatically and far better? World Anvil, your sidekick, companion, and second brain for all things world building and writing. The wiki-like article system is great. It allows you to simply write and let the machine handle organization. But that's not enough? What if you wanted to use interactive maps, diplomacy webs, family trees and charts to lend a visual aid to your writing? You get all that and then some with World Anvil. Oh, what's that you say? You wanted to one day monetize your writing even? You can actually monetize access to your world if you're a coin crab and make bank off a system that neatly compiled all your work. Goodbye long nights of editing and organization. Hello 3am world building sessions. Yay! 40% off your annual sub in the link in the description below. See you there. Roll post. Steve, not his real name, was an infamous DM in my university gaming group. His infamy came from two things, describing everything in the most minute detail like he was trying to outdo the word count of Lord of the Rings in every session, and for the most ambitious campaign I have ever participated in. Now, I'm sure you've heard of No Limits Campaigns, campaigns where you can use any book in a game's library for your character and whatnot. Back in 3.5, when the epic took place, that meant a lot of books. I think the hard drive my friends and I were using had 200 gigabytes of books on it. For Steve, that wasn't enough. Not only could you use any 3.5 book, you could use any RPG system that you wanted. Heck, you could even combine them. You want a big eyes, small mouth background character with 3.5 warlock levels and equipment from GURPS? Sure, Steve would make that work. A truly limitless character creation seems like it would be ambitious enough, but Steve took it one step beyond. Because we all were in university, we often did not have schedules that matched up, although Steve always seemed to have time. Normally, that would mean a small party or a large gap between sessions. Steve had another idea. Players could have sessions whenever they had time, even if it was just them and him. On top of this, there were no limits to the number of players. With the campaign growing to about 24 people, all having sessions at different times and with different groups. Finally, the cherry on top of all of this. Every action was in the same universe, regardless of time period. Some players played a D20 modern campaign, and Steve made them the descendants of some of his fantasy characters. Actions that the historical players took affected quests in subtle ways in the space opera TTRPG. This didn't just cover his campaign either. Players were in other campaigns too, and Steve would routinely try and force other campaigns' stories into his. And there it is, time. This went to the flames expeditiously. First, as admittedly cool as some of this sounds, we all know this is insane, right? The madman in charge took three ideas that are extremely hard to do on their own and committed to doing all of them incorrectly. All of them have been done successfully in one way or another somewhere, but having an effective time travel system that's regularly used, mixing systems, all while incorporating 24 players? Doing any one of these would be incredibly difficult. 
doing all three simultaneously can't end in any way but disaster. But hey, maybe I'm wrong. Let's take a look-see. We'll post. Needless to say, this was a nightmare for players. There were some times when players became paralyzed with a choice because they were worried about it affecting something somewhere else and breaking an unseen chain of events and others when they thought something was going to happen, only for it to have changed because of a game the day before that they weren't even involved in. Some of us, though, had fun with it. Pete, a recurring character from this saga, was getting upset with things happening in his campaign that were caused by a time-traveling campaign that was also happening. Yes, Steve allowed interdimensional travel between campaigns. So, after his character was arrested by the Time Cops for something that his 34th generation grandson did, and had to sit in prison for a few sessions, he asked to play another character in a one-on-one -on -one session just to bide his time. Using D20 Modern, Pete rolled up a... CRA Accountant, the Canadian version of the IRS. He wanted to play during tax time and launched an investigation into the Time Cop's income and taxes. To his credit, Steve played a three-hour session doing it but it ended up costing the Time Cops 50k in back taxes. Honestly, I gotta be honest, this is still going better than expected. I mean, it's only a nightmare to navigate, as opposed to the unrunnable mess I predicted. Maybe Steve is the mad scientist of tabletop role-playing games. However, I'm not saying he's a good DM. That remains to be seen, but judging by what we've seen so far, Steve seems much more interested in running a world with rigid rules than running a game that's fun and player-oriented. But that's the price of leaning all the way into these complicated concepts. The more you set in stone, the less free you are to bend and change with the players. Leaning too far either way is usually a bad idea. It's about balance. And I'm willing to bet Steve is way too far on the side of the rules and the world, and not at all concerned about the player experience. I mean, someone gets arrested for something his 34th generation grandson in a different campaign did, and he has to go to jail for a few sessions. What? Anyways, roll post. During one sub-campaign of the Epic of Steve, Pete and I were in a party of feudal adventurers. Think low magic Arthurian legend type of setting. Steve had asked us to each make realistic characters, including a minimum of one fear that could be incorporated into the story. Pete picked a fear of huge creatures as he was playing a peasant farmer that had never seen anything bigger than a cow, and just the thought of anything being bigger than that terrified him. Jeff, another player, picked a fear of deep water as he came from a desert area with very few water features. For the first few sessions, everything was going fine because it was an Arthurian-type setting. The biggest thing we came across was a bear, and we had mostly been in a forest. So, Pete and Jeff were having a good time. We had run into a small hamlet of woodcutters that had asked us to go and explore the local cave system, as there were rumors of a green dragon making a home there. Naturally, the thought of a dragon scared Pete, but the party was able to eventually convince him to come along. Cut to a session later, we tracked the dragon down to a small section of the cave system, but there was a problem. The entrance to the cave was flooded. In order to get in, we would have to dive down and swim through the gap in the wall. Jeff now joined Pete in the no way I'm going in there club, and there was no way to convince either of them to come along. We decided that they would mine the end of the rope that we had pitten to the lip of the pool that the rest of us could follow back afterwards. The party bid them adieu and dove into the water. After roughly a real-world hour of listening to an ancient green dragon philosophize on the nature of time and the universe in general, Steve said his eons of isolation have turned him into sort of a nihilistic preacher. We follow the rope back on surface with Jeff and Pete. We all exit the cave system without incident and go to wrap up the session. Steve. Alright, everyone gets 500 experience for today. Well, not Jeff and Pete, they get 100. Pete. Why? You didn't talk to the dragon, so no RP experience. But 
We couldn't have gone in there because of our fears. Hey, I didn't pick your flaws. You did. Q, Pete storming out and Jeff following behind after flipping off Steve. Wha- Why are these guys so mad? After a couple days of talking to Steve, he eventually made Jeff and Pete have a one-off that took place during their time on the other end of the rope to gain them that extra 400 experience. If I remember correctly, it was basically waiting for Godot, but in a fantasy universe for about an hour. But they remained upset for the next couple sessions. I think I was right about Steve's DMing style. This is what happens when a good motivation turns into a bad action. The DM is motivated by keeping the world consistent and realistic. If you don't listen to the dragon's ruminations, you don't learn, so you don't get XP. I get that. That's part of why I prefer milestone leveling or shared player XP for these reasons. But let's fix that problem session that left the table angry real quick. First, Cut the hour-long rambling about philosophy and replace it with a conversation. The dragon can still philosophize, but I would make it more about how some brand new creatures meet an isolated ancient creature, and together they build a dialogue about how different and in some ways the same the world truly is. I know that if I was completely isolated for literal eons, as soon as I see a new person, I wouldn't immediately preach my worldview at them for an hour. I would have a couple questions. Making the dragon as interested in the heroes as they are in him gives the party meaning and agency, making them something better than an inanimate object to preach nihilistic philosophy at for an hour. Maybe the dragon knows of ancient treasure or enemies. Maybe the dragon is someone who becomes an enemy seeing the new ways as degenerate and in need of correction. But, things are not well above ground. The other half of the party are attacked by bandits or maybe dragon worshippers. That way, they get the same XP and the other half of the party isn't completely abandoned and punished for playing their characters. Boom, great session, everyone's happy. You can even construct an entire campaign off of that. Unfortunately, this DM would not do that. I think that there is a great DM buried under the surface. He seems like a smart person, with a huge mental capacity to run this game in a borderline functional way, all by himself. He also has a philosophical mind. But, there's more to DMing than storytelling, rules knowledge, and mental capacity or improv. You need emotional intelligence. You need to understand the players and design the game with them in mind, not just your campaign and story and characters. But he will never do that throughout the course of this entire story because he has 24 players to focus on. And we're already seeing the negative effects of his other systems like time travel in other players' games. Anyways, roll post. In an Asian-themed campaign, I was playing a ninja as my third character. Before explaining my other two characters, I have to explain something about this campaign. Steve modeled this setting on Imperial China and had strict cultural rules for all of us. These rules, however, were never explained to us until we transgressed them because, well, you should know this because that's how things ran in 16th century China. He seemed to expect that we would spend our off time getting a doctorate in Asian history so we could play in his world. My first character was executed by a village mob after showing off his magic to a group of children. The second character, a samurai, was forced to kill himself after a major failure of honor. My third character was a ninja who swore himself into the service of a different character, so I thought I had some layer of plot armor, or so I thought. Steve hated ninjas. He thought they were unworthy of being heroic characters, but he did not outlaw it because he wanted us to play whatever we wanted. I offered to play something else, but he insisted that I could play what I wanted. He said there would be no issue with it. Instead, he just tried to outright kill my ninja. Being on my third character, I gritted my teeth and tried to outlive everything thrown at me. Which I did. Fireballs, traps, deadly poisons, the god of dice smiled upon me, and I lived through all of it. Even the big bad evil guy failed to kill him in an almost one-on-one. 
finally, I guess Steve has had enough. The party had entered into the tomb of a necromancer, and we were tasked with finding and killing him. As a ninja, I was the scout of the group, so I entered a room full of bones. Naturally, I hid behind a big pile of bones when I heard footsteps coming. Suddenly, the bones started to rattle and shake. Before my ninja could react, I was immediately crushed and died from the force of a reanimating black dragon skeleton that was rising out of the bone pile in front of me. I don't get a save? No, you're too distracted to hear anything. But it's a skeleton, I should have room to escape. Nope, you're already crushed. Your eyeball flies out and hits the floor with a wet thud. The entire party was in shock, but Steve just smiled and handed me a pre-made sheet that he already had ready. Oh, come on. This character sheet was of a much more honorable character. Knowing I didn't really have much of a choice, I grabbed the sheet and laughed off another death. Just another headstone, I said. The lesson is, if you don't like a PC, talk with them about it. Don't just drop a dragon skeleton on them. Oh, come on, Steve. I just appreciated you for your good traits. You're embarrassing me in front of my crabs. I don't even know where to start. This is textbook terrible DMing. I mean, all the previous stories were too, but at least I saw, like, a forsaken vision of what could have been. This just feels like those stories where an idiot bashes you over the head with cruelty and tries to ruin your experience. In the spirit of being so thoroughly over this guy, let's tear this story to shreds. First, expecting everyone to take an advanced course on 16th century China of all places is idiotic at best. It feels like he's trying to be that guy who needs everyone to know how smart he is. Of course this is the way it is. What do you mean you don't know the niche intricacies of this specific subset of another continent hundreds of years ago? Oh. You should just be smart like me. That alone is awful, but then turning around and saying, Oh yeah, by the way, we're adding skeleton dragons and magic. Don't get me wrong, having a realistic world but just adding some monsters and magic, it works. It's okay. But having a character executed for displaying magic, in a world where there are said magic and monsters, without telling anyone it's a big secret, again, is stupid at best, intentionally cruel at worst. And the worst part of it all, the absolute worst, is the dishonesty and punishment for not reading his mind and executing his will. He will lie to your face, tell you you're doing just fine, and then, if you make a character that he is somewhat annoyed by for arbitrary reasons, boom, dead. Unceremoniously executed in the most ham-fisted, crude way possible. Anyways, in the second part, the DM finally snaps, and the series ends. If part two is out yet, it's in the box in the corner. If you don't see a box in the corner, then hey, congratulations, you're here early. The second part should be up in a couple days. If you want to catch it when it releases, make sure to subscribe and hit that bell. Till next time.